Eric Friedman, I'm going to ask you some questions on a man that is certainly the, the most powerful, probably um, the most powerful name in the history of the violin, Niccolo Paganini. When did you first hear that name in the, in the uh, beginnings of your life and career? I think my mother's obstetrician's name was Paganini. <laughs> Are you kidding? Oh, yes, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> as far back as I can remember, I've heard the name Paganini. Every violinist has. Anybody who has. How did it happen, though? What, do, you, do you remember exactly what happened? It's well, it's, it starts from the first time uh, a youngster becomes... Well, my father was a violinist, number one. He's a dentist by profession, but he was an amateur fiddler who quit when I told him to play in tune one day. But uh, that's another story. And uh, so when that first inclination, that first glimmer of interest to be a musician, to be a violinist, is always uh, accompanied by the comment, will you ever play the Paganini Concerto? Will that be possible? The Paganini Concerto, for, uh, seemed, if not the ultimate, at least the penultimate of difficulty, of, of scintillating virtuosity, and uh, the, uh, the Mount Everest. To That's be come down to us, that That's concept, right? right? Mm -hmm. I was speaking of the D major violin concerto. Yes, yes that one. And uh, uh, just in that context, uh, somehow or other, it was when I was fortunate enough to get my RCA rec recording contract as a youngster. Uh, that, uh, even though I didn't play the piece at the time, was delegated as my debut record. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn the Paganini Concerto, but I was so ambitious in those years, I wrote my own cadenza, and uh, which I don't play anymore because it's too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, you've become experienced. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I play some other cadenzas that are less difficult but more effective, maybe. And um, and ironically, I don't consider Paganini's music today to be the most difficult. For violin, what? But Paganini was now, the why ironically, because just because it is supposed because to be, it is yeah. considered uh -huh. that and really isn't. But what it is is that Paganini was the first impressionist. He brought nature into music. He brought birds. Mm -hmm. He brought the hippopotami. <laughs> is that the correct the color? Color of soprano. Exactly. He brought everything into his music, and he he made it a kind of pastiche and a conglomerate, a conglomeration, and a and a and a. Uh, just a melting pot of all kinds of impressions. And his music is extremely exciting for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as opposed to the music of Ludwig Spohr, that really is, from a technical point of view, more difficult, except it is not a showy. Not a as, showy. As a result. And, and it's not played. And not played. Now, well, did you fact, play anything? The, did you ever do the Eighth Concerto? Or? Oh, yes, the Gesang mm -hmm. The uh, And Spohr was an amazingly prolific composer. I think he wrote about ten operas or something and innumerable symphonies yes, and oratorios. Or Some incredible amount. Quartets. Quartets. Great amount of chamber music, oratorios. And he had, he had the first great career, too. I mean, when they say Paganini was the career, Spohr had side-by-side uh, -side with him. They were both touring at the same time. Um, both born around the same time, and I think that you know Chopin heard Paganini in 1826, 27 in Warsaw. But Spohr had already been there, and um, Spohr, Spohr's music was made made a big impact on him because it was probably more of the new Romanticism with its chromaticism than Paganini's, which was still like an Italianate Rossini on the violin. But as you say, bringing all of these you know extra. Uh, things that the violin could do. So That's well. right. What about those caprices? I know that your teacher Heifetz uh, never made a recording of them, and I think that he, his, the few that he did are with piano accompaniment, right? That yes. used to be the fashion. Yes. How come? I think, and now this is just conjecture on my part, but I think that uh, with all pretension, I think there's nobody alive who knows Heifetz like I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, and this I've never discussed with him, that it's the kind of music, Pegany is the kind of music that shows effort. And Heifetz would never play anything of difficulty where it might show effort. Oh, interesting. And what, what do you mean, effort? What does that mean? Well, uh, uh, there, that, that there might be some times when... It, when, when uh, uh, just the sheer mechanism might show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it's I understand that. Now, is this because... It's like asking Thomas Aikens, you know, to make a, a, a false brushstroke. Yes. And uh, this, I think, was the, the, the primary consideration. It might even been, have been subliminal to Heifetz. I don't think he knew it. He did record some of the caprices, but the, some of the caprices do not lend themselves to uh, to um, the kind of uh, very seamless, exciting approach that was Heifetz's mm -hmm. forte. Heifetz would it would have it would have been beneath him to to have made an effort. Then he was so aristocratic in his concept of technique then. That's right. Is that it? Yes. Uh -huh. What are your experiences uh, with Paganini, be it likes or dislikes, um, about the man or your own uh, playing of the music? You still play the D major concerto? Yes. Or in concert, you still do? Yes, on and occasion. I don't what is that? Is that like the Liszt concerto, which is certainly not as difficult, let's say, as uh, the Rachmaninoff third? Is it as is it as difficult as, let's say, the Sibelius or the Bartok, or is it is it not as difficult? No, the difficulty of Paganini is not its difficulty as music, it's its difficulty of preparation. It's the kind of work that entails an enormous amount of work constantly. Mm -hmm. It's not terribly difficult getting back to boxing. It's not uh, terribly difficult if one has the talent and the speed and the strength to be a heavyweight champion. What's difficult is the training. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's possible to play, for example, the Beethoven or the, uh, the Brahms or the Mendelssohn and pick it up for after a few days for an experienced artist, somebody who's played for a number of years. I can play these, uh, these pieces in very, very short notice, but I can't play the Paganini like that. Mm -hmm. It takes me... Uh, the training has to be there. I have to be uh, very much in shape mm -hmm. to play that. So as a result, it's really not worth it. Just from you know, when one gets older, one gets involved in a lot of things and a lot of different things and various things, and one doesn't have the time to, to spend just mm -hmm. the hours mm -hmm. of very careful preparation and practicing that Paganini necessitates. So it doesn't stay in the hand, so to speak? It doesn't stay in the hands, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it quality-wise? I mean, for instance, did you study the caprices as as your friend Michael Rob Rabin did? Yes. Did you play them all, the twenty-four caprices? Sure, I studied them all. What I did only they do played... for you, though, technically? What? I think that um, Paganini is effect music, and it really is not effective for. for uh, it's a very specialized kind of hand. First of all, Paganini himself had a very specialized kind of hand. Um, what do you mean? He had an enormous hand. It was. It, uh, the the uh, Paganini Caprices are made for an enormous hand. Mm -hmm. He himself had a tremendous stretch and a very enormous hand. That might even been, uh, have been pituitary. I think that, uh, uh, that in his later years, I have a certain kind of personal theory that uh, Paganini was a little bit acromegalic. He suffered from a pituitary tumor that, uh, uh, as evidenced by uh, how he died, uh, leading to a certain kind of elongation of his long bones and might have led to the elongation of his fingers, too. He certainly had a weird body. Yes, an extremely a typical acromegalic. Hmm. Uh, very longish nose and exophthalmic eyes. You know, I hate to sound like a medical. Everybody's a medicine in my family, so I'm, mm -hmm. I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really feel that Paganit himself, as evidenced by the fact that he was able to only really play his own music after the age of 40, that's when he had his career. He, he, he began very, very late to really become an effective performer. And uh, so as a result, Pagani, people who prepare and practice a lot of Paganini have a tendency to do their hands damage unless they have a, have a certain kind of a hand. And I'm sure there's a, there's a, there's a very great analogy amongst pianists, a certain kind of piano music. Mm-hmm. Yes. For instance, a Joseph Hoffman would, knew enough not to dare play the Rachmaninoff third with his kind of hand, That's right. even though it was dedicated to him. That's right. Now, in the world of violinism, uh, did, he, did Paganini begin a school of violin, let's say, uh, like um, Liszt began a school of virtuo virtuoso piano playing? Was there a tradition that stemmed from him? He seems an isolated fact as a performer. Just as the first four-minute miler 
uh, didn't uh, uh, form a school after him, after after his particular run. Either did Paganini, but what Paganini did was form a school of inspiration. Mm. After a, after a certain violinist hearing him, and Paganini did have a, a, a few students. Uh, yes, he did. You know, one can document who whom they taught, whom they were involved with, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, when it was when it was heard to be possible to create effects on the violin that were never uh, deemed possible before, uh, he created a whole plethora of, of uh, instrumentalists like Vieton, for example, that led directly to Vinyavsky, mm -hmm. and led to Ernst, that led to um, Burmeister, and that led to various uh, uh, violinists of the era who were able to bowl. The and Norwegian Kubelik. Paganini. That's mm -hmm. right. He, in other words, he he uh, uh, he was the inspirational force for the outburst of of violinistics in the 19th century, right? That's right. I would say that that I have been very very formed by Yasha Heifetz simply because I've studied with him. But frankly, I was listening to a recording of myself made of a performance of mine before I met Heifetz, and there was a great similarity in my style. He had already affected you. He had affected me simply by having heard him. The next step was to go see him. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I said, this happens with pianists, this happens with vocalists. Once a certain kind of vocalism is heard, it becomes possible and one begins to emulate it because it's moving. Yeah. And uh, what what I did learn from Yasha Heifetz from that, uh, from that was how to do it mm -hmm. without it becoming damaging to my, uh, to my nervous system. Mm -hmm. Youngsters can do almost anything. Parrots can say certain uh, words, but they can uh, they don't understand what they're saying. Yes. And the element of career is being able to live a normal life and still do extraordinary things. Yes. To live an ordinary life and still do extraordinary things, and that dichotomy can is is the most disruptive and most uh, difficult existence to uh, to to forbear. And I think that uh, this is a, a very great fact of life for artists that simply is not taken into account. Mm -hmm. The candy store, as I might call it, you have to have enough inventory in the candy store. So if somebody walks in off the street, you'll have maybe what they want, but not so much that you go broke. You have to merchandise right. That's right. Well, Paganini was a merchandiser of his um, hardware, so to speak, as no performer had ever been, Spohr included, Viotti before him, and no pianist, not Dussek, Hummel, there had been nothing like him in the history of the performing art as it was emerging into the middle class with his mature appearance, let's say, in the 1820s, and it would burgeon even more into the 30s. Uh, he was more important to the world of the performing romanticists than Liszt was in the 30s. He was at the peak then. Um, uh, what what was this all about in the in the European scene? That that this man who could disappear, let's say around 18 four and five, and play the guitar for several years and. And, and have a local Italian career, mm -hmm. then suddenly Europe goes wild. And he is certainly, he's in Warsaw, uh, he's in um, uh, Vienna making a sensation, he does, makes f a fortune in Scotland, he comes down in 1831 and practically with, you talked about inspirational force to other violinists, List said, oh my God, what a violinist, what suffering on those four strings, and proceeded to, to take notes as he would come out, so to speak, effectively on the, on the stage of the Paris Opera. Um, this cadaver-like man who, who Delacroix painted in one of the most extraordinary, um, uh, as if the body was breaking apart, an apparition of the diabolical aspects of Romanticism. 
can you tell me what you feel about this? Because it, has, it still exists. It's the image of Paganini. He is certainly not a composer that ranked with Chopin or, or Liszt himself. And yet, it retains, the, gla the man retains the glamour. Well, I have a feeling that... I that went on a little long. But no, no, you, you put it very well. I have a feeling that, um, to a great extent, that Paganini was the first pop star because he legitimized just straight tunes. I mean, his music, is, uh, to, to a great extent, are tunes. Mm -hmm. Most of his caprices are tunes mm -hmm. with, with variations around them. And uh, you must remember that at the time of his music, um, Berlioz was already uh, very active, Peg uh, Beethoven, the great works of Mozart, there was a tremendous amount of musical sophistication, and all of a sudden along comes Paganini with really nothing much in his music except extreme beauty. It was just their tremendously uh, inspirational tunes. The bel canto transferred to the violin in, exactly. in the simplest way it had ever been, maybe. Exactly. Simple to the ear. Simple to the ear, and enjoyable and also very impressive. Enjoyable is an interesting word. This now was the first time that someone could be that scintillating and get away with it uh, without having to kowtow to the big forms. That's right. The miniature was being built. And these caprices just really had an amazing influence in a certain way. I've called Paganini the spiritual father of piano playing. Yes, to a great extent. I think it has a, one has a tendency to forget everyday facts of life when, it, when one looks at it in the overview and in mega history. Actually, the element of Paganini was a very kind of a, a, almost a peasantish Italian, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but he had a certain background. He was a gambler. He loved women. He loved to fool around. He probably, God knows what he took, what he imbibed. And uh, he was a character mm -hmm. who was kept out of the best homes. Mm-hmm for fear that they lose their daughters, you know. This was the kind of uh, man he was. He was a, a man who had varying diseases. He <laughs> said, I am physically repulsive, but all I do is t t pick up my violin and women fall on there at, at my feet. Exactly, exactly. So what he was able to do was to become the first hippie. That's what he was. And he was able to, he was a very accomplished musician. Yes. Played the piano, played the guitar, played the violin extraordinarily well. And also, he was very imaginative. He knew how to, to, to make uh, the, uh, something that was for high society. One must remember that music, as we know it, and most of the great symphonies that we call for the people were written for royalty. The average person didn't get into that hall. He couldn't afford it, number one, and it was not for him. It was for the upper classes, not the lower classes. All of a sudden, along came a musician of the people mm -hmm. who wrote tunes and made them extremely enjoyable that even the king himself wanted to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And he became a star because of it, and he became uh, and he became a cult figure. And they used to, uh, to 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 design pastry, you know, after him, and said, you know, and uh, opened could... the gambling house in Paris. Exactly, mm -hmm. the first superstar, the first yeah. uh, the first Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. and he played it to a hilt, of course. Absolutely understood show business, perhaps in a way better than Liszt did, because oh. he was all show business. He didn't have that. That later pretension is not a good word. That that aspiration to to merge his his showbiz virtuosity and glamour for the people to to the introspective artist or list, of course, would never have been able to have left the public at 36. Paganini had none of that. He was out to wow. That's right. And, I, and not only that, he was uh, antithetical in terms of looks. I mean, he was a very homely man. List was a beautiful man. Yeah. And yet both, even his homeliness was of such extravagance that it caught something in the romantic That's epic. Right. There's an old saying that for, in terms of looks that a man doesn't have to wash or comb or do any of these things because there's some woman looking for him exactly the way he is and she has to find him because she has to help him. Yeah. And Peg and Indy found many helpers. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Now, um, where else can, what else shall we, we've done 20 minutes on him, very good material. Any other things come to your mind, Derek, on uh, Paganini? At this, tomorrow you'll have a few more, but that won't count. We're here at 
I really can't think of it offhand. We've said a lot. Thank you. I enjoyed it.